Hi, this is Pastor Andre Little of Labor Love Ministries at Father's House of Prayer. I want to welcome you today to the message that God has put on my heart that I must share with you. And the topic of the day is pretty much, it's one question that I have to ask. And that question is, are you expecting Jesus to come? Repeat again, are you expecting Jesus to come? You know, Jesus made very clear that he would be coming back. And he actually had um, made sure that we would be aware of that. You know, when he died on Calvary, and actually before he died at Calvary, he foretold that again he would return to the earth. And he also said a lot of things we read around that 25th chapter of, of the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. And he told his disciples that they would find something in him in which they would disapprove to the point that they would not acknowledge him on the very same night it happened. You probably think, well, how could somebody be walking with Jesus, seeing the things that Jesus did day after day after day, and then when things get a little bit rough, to basically act like you don't even know him. It wasn't just Peter. He said all of them would. And they all scattered. It's how it is oftentimes when it gets a little hot in the kitchen. Many of us, we flee. It's another topic. Jesus talked about that also. But also, did you know that Jesus, when he left out the temple... And for the last night he left out of the temple, he called the leaders, those who were learned in the sacred holy scriptures. He called them snakes and he called them basically a, a progeny of vipers. And he told them, he said, how is it that you think that you will escape the judgment of hell? He said this to the leaders. So these are three kind of like important questions I wanted to bring up here because everything is linked up to the second coming of Jesus. Because he told his disciples that basically it would not be one stone left on top of the other. So look at this temple here. You won't see it like this ever again. It will all be torn down. Now, you probably say, well, what's so significant about that, Pastor Andre? Well, I want you to know that Jesus said that he is the truth. I would tell my daughters all the time, that the truth is not indicative based upon someone's belief. See, the truth stands on its own. Doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It is the truth. And Jesus said he is the truth. And it's how unfortunate that many people, billions, have not acknowledged him for who he is. Well, the reason I avoid the part about the temple, and you can go to the site, if you're just looking at this only on the YouTube channel, you can visit streetministries.org and you can read all about it. But it talks very clearly about what took place right around the year 68 AD. And this is when Titus, <clears throat> basically came on the scene who was the son 
of a certain leader at that time. And this son, who was a leader, is the one who led them into going in and destroying the Jewish, the Jewish temple. And keep in mind, this is something that's very important. Jesus is the last sacrifice. There is no need for any other sacrifices after Jesus. He is the only one that can atone for our sins. It's not a million man march or a million woman march or a billion man march that can atone for our sins. Jesus did that at Calvary. He is the only one that can atone for our sins. So this act that he did at Calvary was for humankind to be able to be reconciled back to God, to be put back in right standing with God the Father. There were to be no more animal sacrifices any further after what happened at Calvary because no animal sacrifice can do what needed to be done for humankind. It had to be a man and there was only one man that can do what could be done for humankind to reconcile man back to God and his name is Jesus. He's the only one. And so when you read on the site there, some of you are going to say, I don't believe in the Bible. You don't have to believe in the Bible. That's up to you. That's your choice. That's your free will, which God gave you a gift to be to choose. But every choice has a consequence of our actions. No matter who you are, you need to know that that's the truth. I'm not here to try to, to get in good favor with you or to make you feel good. I'm here to bring you a message, and that message is the truth of God. You may not like what I'm saying. Matter of fact, you may want to shut me up. You may want to punch me in the mouth. You may want to stone me. You may do a number of things. But I'm here to present the truth to you, and if the truth rattles you, then you need to find out why is it rattling you so much so that you can be able to have an understanding of who God really is and how much he cares about you. Now, if you don't even want to go off the Bible, one of the most famous Jewish historians, you can research it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Research it out. Search out the matter. Read. Get understanding. Well, this Jewish leader is one of a great historian who was called Josephus Flavius. Josephus actually was one that was rebelling against the Roman Empire. He didn't want to see the temple destroyed, but Rome captured him and they brought him back. And when they brought him back, he gave firsthand, firsthand account of what took place in that temple there. And how it was destroyed. And how it was burned down to the ground. Just as Jesus said, this very thing would happen. <clears throat> and people thought that would never happen. They knew how sacred the temple was to Judaism and to the Judeans. But God was not pleased with what was happening in that temple. Just as God is not pleased today with what is happening in many churches. And I say this. Just because judgment isn't coming suddenly doesn't mean that it's not coming. And so I want you to know we must prepare ourselves for the second coming of Jesus. Now, what do I mean by prepare ourselves? I want you to understand the disciples who were walking with Jesus. They began to ask Jesus, said, what and when should this take place? When shall we see these things of your Second coming when you coming back. 
And Jesus said, it will be just the same as it was in the days of Noah. People will be so busy with their life going about it just in their normal routine. Some given to marriage, some preparing for marriage. You know, some still hanging out, partying, drinking, doing the things they normally do. But you got to really begin to think about why is it that Jesus warned them about what will be happening in these last days before we turn. Well, <clears throat> Jesus made it very clear. He said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. <clears throat> this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he said that the kingdom of heaven is like Ten virgins. Ten virgins. And five of these virgins are without forethought and without wisdom. And the other five are prudent. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what Jesus said. But let me begin to break down to understand what he was saying here. You say, well, what does this have to do with the second coming about the virgins here? This is what Jesus said to his disciples of what the kingdom of heaven is like. Well, what does forethought mean? Forethought means says careful consideration of what will be necessary or may happen in the future. So these unwise virgins, they weren't considering what may happen in the future. They weren't being careful about considering their future. And he said also, without wisdom, when God says without wisdom, you better listen. Because you can change this. It doesn't have to mean it has to be this way in the end. You can change by not being wise. His word makes very clear. Wisdom is a quality of having experience or knowledge of good judgment. A quality of being wise. I'm going to give you several scriptures here that you can check for yourself. In the book of Psalms 111 verse 10. It is decreed that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. You got to know what the commandments are first before you can even begin to know wisdom. Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. This is the word of God. I'm speaking just what the word of God says. You read it for yourself. Stop making excuses about what you don't know. Because I promise you, ignorance will be no excuse before God. He will say, I sent my preachers. I sent my prophets. I sent them to forewarn you. And many kill the true prophets. Many kill those who speak the truth. I am not here to sugarcoat anything. I'm not here to get you excited. I'm not here to give you an itchy ear gospel. I'm concerned about what God is concerned about, and that is your very soul. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 7 says he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. Who are the righteous? The word of God makes very clear that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you can't be righteous. Outside of Jesus, you're not righteous. 
Outside of Jesus, you are the wicked. Outside of Jesus, you're down to hell. Outside of Jesus, it is the worst thing you can be. Doesn't have to be that way. Because the blood that was shed at Calvary was meant to redeem mankind back to God. But you got to believe that Jesus is who he say is. You got to repent of your sins. You got to turn from wickedness. You got to confess that he, Jesus, is Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 13 says, happy is the man that what? That find the wisdom. Everybody talking about how they deserve to be happy. They trying to go and seek all these things, these physical, natural things to make them happy. And realize in the end what a high cost there is. God's word says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And I'm breaking down to you, what is wisdom? And this says also a man that gets understanding. Too many of us get information. We don't understand what we have. This is why God sends the preachers. Some call a five-fold ministry. There ain't no five-fold ministry. There's only really four. He says, I send you apostles. I send you the prophets. I send you evangelists and what we call teaching pastors. Pastors that teach. There's no pastor that does not teach. You got to be one of the same. One that passes, one that instructs, one that corrects, one that reproves, one that covers, one that intercedes on your behalf. Not one that tries to just to shear all the wool off the sheep for themselves. Those are the true pastors. We need to wake up. Things are going to get much more challenging for the church in these last days. And you need to be aware of what's coming down the road. In the word of God in Proverbs 8, 11, It is decreed that for wisdom is better than rubies. So many of us want bling bling. We're out doing the things that the world does. We want what the world has. When it's the saddest thing when we have what the world should be wanting. But we want to be like the world. And the, the most difficult thing about this is that the world looks at those who are doing these things that they're doing and say, well, why do I need to get saved? Because you're doing what I do. That's what Jesus said. It's better for you to be hot or cold, but not lukewarm. For I will spew you out of my mouth. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. Don't take the word of God lightly. Do not take the word of God lightly because heaven and earth may pass, but his word always was, always is, and always will be. The last verse I want to share with you here is Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. When you become saved, you become holy. You're sanctified by God. Now it's up to you whether you're going to act that out. How the life you're going to live. Now let me share this with you. As I tone it down a little bit. I want you to know that God visited me in a dream years ago back. And it showed a family member who was in a certain situation. I'm not here to try to embarrass anybody. We all have done wrong. I know I have. But I thank God for the blood of Jesus that has washed me, that has cleansed me, that has played me in right standing with God the Father. That I didn't deserve any of it. But he still loved me enough to engraft me in the body of Christ. And I... I'm going to always love him for that. And I hope that everything I do pleases him. I'm not here to please man. Because I know I can't do both. It's either one or the other. And so, in this dream, 
He showed me something about a family member and, and that thing came to pass. Now, that's not even my point. But then I left out one of my businesses and I began to walk down the street. And as I'm walking down the street, there are apartment houses on the right side, apartment houses on the left side. And I begin to sing a song. And as I begin to sing the song, people were opening up their windows trying to hear what I was saying. And some of them, when they heard what I was saying, they began to shut the windows. And all I was doing for warning, letting them know what was about to happen. And I was singing the song just as God gave it to me. And I put a little twist on it in the end. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? Will you have oil in your lamps? Will you have oil in your lamps? Because soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King of Kings, Jesus, Lord of Lords, Savior of the world. So I give this to you as he gave it to me. And I share this with you in love to forewarn you that you must be born again. Because there were five virgins that were unwise. They had no forethought. And there were five virgins who were prudent, who thought about their future, who considered what was coming, what was going to take place, this event. And Jesus said, the bridegroom, he delayed his coming. The bridegroom delayed his coming. And then at midnight, when they weren't expecting because they were asleep, they were slumbering asleep. And they came when he did not expect them to come. When he come, will he find you in the club? When he come, will he find you on drugs? When he comes, will he find you drunk? When he comes, will he find you just partying? When he comes, will he find you ready on your watch? Because he said, watch. And then when the bridegroom announced the outcry that he's here, the five unwise virgins who had no forethought, who weren't thinking about their soul, that they will have to spend eternity They were busy being distracted. And they asked the ones who were prudent, said, give us some of your oils. We can have some of our lanterns so we can do it. And the prudent one said, no. That's we don't have enough for you and I. You go. And you go and find those who are selling. You buy from them. But we're going to the bridegroom now. And those five that went, they got in. They got in. A little while later, the other five, came knocking on the door. Came knocking on the door. And said, sir, sir, let us in. Let us in. Sir, sir, let us in. 
open at once to us. Jesus said to these other five who had no forethought, who had no wisdom, assuredly, I am saying to you, I do not know you. And he said, be ever on watch, therefore, because you do not know the day nor the hour. So my question is, do Jesus know you? My wife says, Jesus don't have no grandchildren. It ain't about your grandma, it ain't about your nanny, it ain't about your grandpa, it ain't about your unk. Ain't about your brother, about your sister. Ain't about some so-called leader. It's about a personal relationship with him knowing you for himself. You must be born again. You have a body. This body is a temple. Your body's here in the earth realm. It's only for the physical realm. You have a spirit. Your spirit is what I like to call a comatose state. Your spirit is dead. You're basically a dead man, dead woman walking if you have not been born again. Don't care how much you know. And you have a soul. Right now, you are best our soulless being. You may do good deeds. You may go out and volunteer. You may go contribute. You may go to courthouse steps and get people who have been justly wrong and get them off of a prison and they make me feel good. You may go out and help the homeless. You may feed the poor but he still does not know you. It's not based off of your deeds. You must be born again. Only when you're born again, the Holy Spirit must awaken your spirit. When the Holy Spirit wakens your Holy Spirit, you now become born again. Now God can commune with you the way he desires to with your spirit. And you don't have to become a soulless being, but yet a spiritual being. You want the soulless man to be subjected to the spirit man. Right now, that's why you're going out, you're living out, doing things all you want to do. That's what your soul desires. But you want to be doing what God desires. And it's very easy. The word of God says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died, and that God raised him, and he said you should be saved. Repent, repent, turn from, turn from wickedness, turn from that sinful lifestyle. And so this is what I want to share with you. Come to Jesus before it's too late. All I'm doing is sound the alarm. I'm speaking right now to you. Whoever you are hearing this, it's for you to hear. Some of you are going to the church places. You're in the church choirs. You're in the church band. You're in the church pulpit. Maybe the, the pastor's child, son or daughter. But if you ain't living the life that God told you to be living, check yourself. There's no way that you can continue doing the things that the world does and not be convicted of if you've been born again. Let me share a story with you. Because I wasn't always like this. I remember after I got saved and I got the Holy Ghost, a friend of mine invited me to come to a party. Just you no know, around friends and family and things like that. And when it was a private place where they had the matter at. And I I had my girlfriend who's now my wife now of going over over 28 years now. But they put on the music. When they put on the music, somebody said, Come on, do you want to dance? And I usually I always say, Yeah. And I get on the floor and I begin to try to move my body. Like I used to move my body when I had a woman in front of me. And I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. I felt something was different. Something was wrong about it. And when I got home and I told my girlfriend, I said, it's, it's not right. I should not be moving my body or, or some woman should not be moving her body in, in front of mine. That's not my wife. I got convicted by that. It's no way that you can go do these things and think that it's right. The Holy Spirit convicts us so that we will repent and get back in right standing with God the Father. So I'm praying right now. Father, 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the souls that are hearing what you allow me to say, Father. I pray, Father God, Lord, that they, Father God, will come to know you as their children, Lord, of the Most High God. I pray, Father God, that this goes out to them, Lord, and that it ministers to their heart, Lord, that they know how much you love them, Lord, that you want nothing but the best for them, Lord. I pray, Father God, Lord Jesus, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will just convict them, Father, to, to turn from wickedness, Lord, and to you, Father. For your words decreed in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you said, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from wickedness, then we will hear from heaven, you forgive us our sins and you will heal the land, which is us. Praise God for Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord, that souls be saved, Father. For you already decreed that hell was for the devil and his angels, which are demons. It never meant for human mankind, but unfortunately, billions are following him there. And I pray, Father God, that under the sound of my voice, he will now to say, forgive me, Lord. Save me, Lord. Put me back in right standing, Lord. I want to follow you, Lord. I want to live for you, Lord. I don't want what the world has to offer. I want what you have. I want to be prudent. I want to be ready. I want to be on my watch. I want to stand for holiness and righteousness. I don't want to play with this. I want to walk in the authority of Jesus. That exercise all power over the enemy. As you decree for us to in the earth realm as your true ambassadors. We represent the kingdom of heaven in the earth realm. We represent the king of kings. We're supposed to rule in the earth realm for his glory. And I pray, Father, that many... That many, Lord, will be saved, Lord. I pray this, Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus. If you have repented, and if you've been one to say, Pastor Andre, this is something that's been a blessing to me. I need your prayers, just like you need my prayers. We need each other. There is an enemy against the human race. It's not against the black race, not against the white race, not against the yellow race, not against the brown race and the yellow race. It's against the human race. But we're fighting against you know, certain cultures or, or people, colors or texture of skin. As someone that's not wise, as someone that's you know, unintelligent with the spiritual things of God. You have one enemy. His, his name is Satan. His name is adversary. The, God called me out of, of a certain church, which I love, and it's nothing against her, but he says streets, and he said streets, and I'm like, Lord, what do streets mean? He says saints taking right for Indian earthly territory, supernatural by the spirit of the living God. You got to be a saint. You got to take back what is right for yours in the earth from what he said in the beginning, how he put man in, in that garden for dominionship. You got to take back what is rightfully yours. You know, what is, what is your, what do you have a right to in the earth realm? And it's got to be territory. You got to know how to do it supernaturally, but by what? By the spirit living God, not with the arm of the flesh. You got to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. You don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's something he wants me to teach, wants me to instruct, that you got to be prepared for. And you got to be serious about this. There's no time for games. So I want you to know I love you. Visit the website, Streets ministry.org that's s-t-r-e-e-t-s m-i-n-i-s-t-r-y dot o-r-g and if you're in Orlando then you come as the spirit of God God leads you to worship fellowship but I want you to have what God intended for you to have for you and your family God bless you and know that God loves you and this is a message sent from you, from God to you, to be a blessing to you, not to hurt you, not to belittle you, but to lift you up, to exhort you, to strengthen you, to begin to know who you are in the earth realm, so that the world will look on us and say, I want to know who your God is. God bless you and know that I do all this in love.